Hey, Carol, did you see that last review we got? I did. It was so lovely, so nice. I'm going to read it for everybody. I found this podcast last year and very quickly consumed the current and past episodes. They don't take themselves too seriously, but still manage to be informative. They are also a great deal of fun. I especially love their quotes and book recommendations. However, the book recommendations have caused me to rack up my credit card balance on Amazon, but that's not their fault. I have no self-control. Thank you, Dee and Carol, for helping me look forward to my morning commute. And that's from Brandon the Gemini via Apple Podcasts. And he left it April 2nd. Thank you, Brandon. That is so kind. I'm going to use those words to power us on to this next episode. Let me get us started. Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. It's about a third of an acre. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden an acre and a half out of seven and a half acres in the country. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want others to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's a ho- enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. All righty then. I'm hearing you just fine, Dee. So Dee's holding up her microphone to show that once again, her granddaughter has unplugged it. And so... so I- <laughs> Since you can hear me, I'm going to leave it unplugged so it stays the same throughout the whole episode. Because if we'll I plug be it in now, it'll mess things up. We'll be so, fine. Tell me about your garden. So, beginning on Tuesday till today, and it's still raining. We've gotten over three inches of rain, so not much to report. But <laughs> I did on on a little bit on Sunday, a little bit on Monday. I did get. Some weeding done. So it's, you know, like one bed here and a little bit over there. And, you know, I've checked my seedlings. They're all coming up. They haven't floated away in the floods because we have a flood warning around here. I also spoke to two garden clubs last week about my lost ladies of garden riding, my own club, who graciously, every once in a while, they let me do a program. And then I did the Garfield Park Master Gardeners just up the road. So that was kind of fun. But anyway, it's, been a hunker down for the rain except for that one event on monday but that'll come at the end i'll talk about that so teresa byington has been telling me that you guys have just had torrential rain oh it was like <laughs> yeah torrential <laughs> yeah yeah the gauge on i think it was wednesday morning i went out there and it's it's one of them official gauges so it fills up to an inch and then spills over and i poured out 2.79 inches of rain and then since then it's like another quarter inch and then this morning i guess i don't know another quarter inch and it was raining just a few minutes ago so it's it is a lot of rain yeah i got a half an inch at my house and that's all and that's okay i'm good with that so you want to hear what i did in my garden this week i I was a busy girl I do, it did not rain here the whole time, so I was busy. I ordered some seeds from Seeds of Italy, and I blame Gardener's World. Did you see the episode where the English gardener was growing Italian vegetables in his garden? No, but I, I know growing Italian vegetables is a big deal, and Seeds of Italy is the place to buy the Italian varieties, and I have ordered from them before, but I'm just imagining how Gardener's World reached out from the television put your hands on the keyboard and made you order seeds. Well, the funny part about it is I decided to order some bean seeds that I'm going to have to trellis, which I normally don't do, but I just thought it would be really fun to do. I've done it before, right? Yeah. And I eat, and now I eat a lot of beans. Yeah. But here's the thing, all those beans that I'm going to grow, they were literally make two pots of beans if I'm lucky. If I'm lucky. So we'll see what happens. And I'm kind of excited about it. It'll be fine. And then let's see what else. Oh, I also bought the great big lettuce leaf basil while I was over there because I haven't grown it in years. And I thought, oh, that'll be fun. And so I started that yesterday. My Everleaf Towers, Emerald Towers. Emerald Towers, uh, Everleaf Basil. Everleaf. But it's Thai. This is the Thai one. Yes. 
Okay. So I started the Thai one. I didn't start the other Everleaf yet. And the Thai one's ready to go out and I put it out this week. So I need to start my Everleaf Emerald Towers because I know the other one that's lettuce leaf size is going to go to seed because that's what it does. So I need to do that. I repotted most of my tomatoes from their small jiffy pellets into four inch pots. I did that with some of my marigolds too. I put a bunch of stuff outside. The tithonia are shivering because it's been a little chilly the last couple of mornings. 44, 42. They don't really like that. They don't like no, to be they under do 45. Not. They're fine. They'll they're they're pouting, but they're fine. And then I also ordered my netting for my cut flower garden. And I need to go buy fence posts from Tractor Supply because Jennifer told me, Jennifer from Ladybug, she told me that she uses the electric fence, fence posts, because you can raise them up and down. I might use rebar because I'm me and I'm a little bit down home and I just sort of do that because that's free. So we'll see. And then I did a lot of weeding and also Daniel and Ruthie Pugh came over on their way to Bustani Plant Farm because he was doing appointments only stuff last week. He actually opens on Tuesday. And so I gave them some plants. They came here for one plant. They left with five. (laughs) That's a good trip. And then another listener came by and I gave her some daisies that I had promised. So I'm not giving away tons of plants to people. It's just this worked out because here's what happens when people call and ask me for plants. I don't mind sharing, but then trying to work our schedules. I had three garden coaching clients last week between all of that and everything else I was doing. I've got a lady coming today and I've decided I need to just cut that off for a little bit because I can't, I can't work that out. And then Bill and I put another Vigo garden bed together and now I want two more. So it was a really good garden week. That sounds like a really good garden week. It was. I worked hard. And I hardly worked because, did I mention the rain? Yeah, you're going to be doing a lot of weeding once it dries out. Oh, my goodness gracious. Anyway, let's play favorites. You go first. So along my walkway to the front door, there are crocuses that come up. There are these little jonquil things that come up. I planted a bunch of violas there. But the pansies I planted there last fall have uh-huh. come back and they are blooming. And I'm like, oh, this is very nice. And I wrote a blog post about it. People are talking about the winter that wasn't because it was mild. And we have mild yeah. winters. So it just meant that those probably got radiant heat from the sidewalk as well. And so they they made it through. They don't look great, but I, I put a picture on there. They look pretty good. I thought anyway. they looked pretty good. And if you pinch them back, they'll be great. And they'll last I was a long thinking time. Thinking about pinching those off and and drying them, pressing them, so that'll be good. But I do I do wonder if the winter that wasn't if that means we're going to have more bugs. And I I've already seen a butterfly, and I don't know you know I don't track. Ooh, Carol saw the first butterfly on this date, but I don't usually see them this early. And I've seen a couple of butterflies out and about. So who knows? What's your favorite? My favorite this week is my service berry because it finally flowered after I planted that like I think two years ago or three I remember years ago. and because you and I actually shopped for it because I wanted to get that cultivar and so the service berry bloomed I'm very excited about it and it managed to make it through the ice storm maybe but it might not have ha- I might have put it after the ice storm but it definitely made it through the fire so that's exciting and I did a little Instagram reel on it I did an Instagram Real, I think every day this week. I saw that. That's good. So the yeah. service berries, mine blooms every year, and every year I'd never pick them, and every year the birds enjoy them. Are you going to pick yours and make something out of them? No, there's not going to be enough to make something out of. Oh. I might eat one. You know what oh. I mean? Yeah. I might have one to eat They're just tart. to try it. They're I tart. bet they are tart. You know what? I'm just as likely to let the birds have them the same way I do with my. Oh, uh, what are those trees? that are so famous. Sambucus, you know, my elderberries. Yeah. Usually the birds get those. I Sometimes I freeze the berries and make syrup, but I'll be honest, I'm so busy gardening. I don't have time to do all that crafty stuff. I know the feeling. All right. I'm going to do a quote and then it's going to take us to our flower topic. 
Spring is singing in my blood today, and the lure of April is abroad on the air. I'm seeing visions and dreaming dreams. That's because the wind is from the West. I do love the West wind. It sings of hope and gladness, doesn't it? And that is L. M. Montgomery. That's a beautiful quote. It is. So our flower topic this week is throw and grow flowers. And we decided to call it this because... In the past, we've called it direct sow flowers, you know, and we just thought throw and go sounded fun. And and I looked up throw and grow because I thought, oh, we should trademark this. A lot of people say throw and grow when there they're talking about easy to easy to germinate. And we don't literally mean throw, like no. in that crazy chaos gardening sense, uh-huh. or you know, you see stuff online. But no, we mean easy to sow. Yeah, direct sow. Flowers that you don't have to start indoors, yes. like tithonia. You d- you should grow up. Even in my long season, you should probably start tithonia indoors. You can direct sow it, but it doesn't work as well. All right. So first up is our favorite flower, my favorite flower, and then probably Carol's second favorite flower, right? Uh, I'm no? going to say it's right up there in the top 10. Zinnias. Okay. Zinnias. Yeah. Zinnias, zinnias. Tomato, tomato. So, so easy. This, so easy. So easy. So easy. I, I always say to people, if you have an empty spot and you want joy, just sow some zinnias out there. And and on top of that, if you've got room, put some sunflowers behind them. Yeah, I this say that too. Pretty. When I've people say, well, if I take all this out, what should I plant? And I say, well, take it all out. And it's spring. Plant some zinnias in there. And then in the fall, when things go on sale and you got a better sense and you're not so rushed around for everything, plant those shrubs that you want in the fall. Take out your zinnias, plant the fall, plant the shrubs. That's what I tell That's people. a great idea. Or perennials if you want to. But here's the thing. You may enjoy them so much that you just don't do that. I have lots of clients who get so many butterflies, so many pollinators that they go, wait a minute, I had no idea. And so that brings us to our second one. Cosmos. So let me just say this about Cosmos. I have a love-hate relationship with Cosmos. As here's do many why. gardeners, I think. Especially gardeners that garden in windy areas. Cosmos is so shallowly rooted that it will flop at the least provocation. And so this year, as I said in my garden update, I am buying netting so that the Cosmos can go up through the netting and then it will be held in place. That's how the flower farmers do it. And I do, I love them because they're beautiful, but I also get tired of deadheading the darn things because they can be kind of messy and picky about deadheading. The thing about Cosmos in my garden is I will direct sow them and they will come up if I don't accidentally weed them out. And, but they don't really put on a display until much later in the summer. So they're not. True. They're not going to be knocking your socks off around here on the 4th of July, but come August. But then, you know, then they're all, you know, like you said, they're all floppy, tilted, you know, squirrel ran by. I got to lean. Stuff like yeah. that. It's like, well, yeah. come on, Cosmo, stand up tall and straight. But anyway, in the right spot and with, and sometimes you just, just have to put a stake by them and tie them up. Yeah, I did that last year. Some favorites of my, well, we should say, okay, so. What's your favorite zinnia that you like to grow? Do you have a favorite? I, favorite my mix? favorite is zinnia and gustifolia, the little tiny ones that yes, I actually will start indoors probably probably this coming week. That's probably my favorite because they just they just do their thing and they don't need nothing from nobody. No, they don't because they're Except short. Except starting indoors. Yeah, they like to be started indoors more. I like the elegans, zinnia elegans and... My favorite mix is probably, I have two. I really love Benary's Giants. There isn't a prettier big zinnia out there. But the Oklahoma series, I tell this to every client, if you're worried about mildew, which is their big thing, grow the Oklahoma series because they mildew the latest. And they're just a great, they're a great flower. And honestly, of that group, Oklahoma salmon and Oklahoma carmine are the most beautiful. Although this year I'm doing a whole yellow cream white series, which is a whole different thing. So Cosmos, what is your favorite Cosmos? I'm going to say that's 
the only one I've really ever grown is that like that they call it seashell. The little petals curl up and looks like a little seashell. That's the mm-hmm. one that I usually end up with a packet of seeds for. So last year, I thought we both both grew apricot lemonade. We might have. I only got yeah, one so plant out of it. So apricot lemonade was beautiful, and it was a little shorter than the normal cosmos. So it didn't flop as bad. So there's that. It was a little harder to get started. The germination rate on it wasn't as good as good old seashells or Piketty or any of those more common ones. My favorite in this group is Rubenza. Rubenza looks really great with Oklahoma carmine zinnias. They're both in that color family. It's just beautiful. And it's a slide on one of my talks and people just go nuts for it. So shall we move on to the next one? So bachelor buttons, I would never have put on the list. It's not a throw and grow here very much. Well, which bachelor buttons are we talking about? Well, you tell we me because I didn't put it on I'm the list. I'm talking about the Centaurus, the little oh, short well, ones yeah. that have the have the silvery foliage and they come in blues or in whites and kind of a darker color. And they're easy to grow at the front of the border and you can direct sow them and they are silvery. Now- Are they the easiest thing to grow? No. There are a lot of times they're put on easy lists, but I don't think they're that easy. So let's kick them off. Kick them off. This is throw and grow. We don't need anything that's sort of like, well, it might be easy, blah, blah. blah. Get out of here. Move on to sunflowers. There's an easy one. Sunflowers. Oh, my gosh. What? What changes there have been in sunflowers since you and oh I started Oh my gardening? gosh. It used to be you just planted those great big tall ones and marveled at the yellow. height. And yeah, yeah. And oh, you can get, oh, Colors. I can't even begin. We both bought the Van Gogh mix from Sunflower Steve last spring. Beautiful, beautiful flowers. And then there's, uh, there's. Uh, I love Strawberry Blonde, which is a burpee introduction. It's one yeah. of the most beautiful sunflowers I've ever grown. And there's another one, and I should have got the packet and brought it in here, but National Garden Bureau sent us the All-American Selection, and I want to, it's got the word Cornet in it, and I'll I'll put it in the show notes. Is it Cornet or is it Concert Bell? Concert because Bell. Because they, also, they sent us it. Concert Bell. I saw it. You know what? I wouldn't remember that at all, but I was flipping through my seed yesterday and looking at what I had, and the sunflower section was very large. And I thought, oh, I should grow that concert bell because it was sent to us by National Garden Bureau. And it's supposed to be a really good one, too. I mean, yeah, of course well, is. you don't get just one flower. You get a whole big spray Branching. of flowers. Yeah, branches. Yeah. And so that one's gorgeous. You can't go wrong with sunflowers. No, you can't. And you know what? They are pretty deep rooted. So usually they won't flop. Occasionally you have to stake them like I did last year, the one that grew in my potage all by itself. But I enjoyed that sunflower so much that was just a volunteer that, but I'm going to put them in a different spot this year. One thing about sunflowers that I just read this week is wait until your soil, is, the temperature of your soil is 70 degrees. We'll talk 70. about soil temperature down in the vegetable section. That that was interesting. Now, before we leave, wait a minute. Before we leave sunflowers, we cannot leave sunflowers without talking about sunflower houses. By Sharon Lovejoy. And didn't you plant a sunflower house for your kids back in the day? I did for Megan because that was when it came out. And Megan still talks about it. In fact, we're probably going to do one this year for Maddie. Do you know that little book, which I don't know if it's still in production or not. So we may need to link to, you know, a place where people can get it. But that little book, Sharon, you know, she's a friend of ours and she listens to this podcast religiously because she'll text me and say, oh, I liked what you said about this. So that's kind of, I mean, talk about having your mentor say you did a good job. I get chuffed actually. Anyway, she's received so many pictures over the last 30 something years for that book. Everyone sends her pictures of their sunflower houses, everyone, and they still send them. So it's one of my all-time favorite books that she wrote, although I well, love them Well, you'll all. have to plant one for Maddie, and then we'll get a picture at the end of the season. So Marigolds, we've talked about Marigolds just a few weeks ago. Easy to grow from seed, but slow to germinate sometimes. So be patient. with Sometimes. Uh-huh. It's back to that warm uh-huh. soil thing again. And I actually started mine inside this year because... 
I just do better with them inside, but you can throw and grow them. Um, you so can. But I'm growing particular varieties. I'm growing Queen Sophia, Court Chester, Hawaii, and then another African one that I can't remember the name of right now. Moonlight. Whew, I can't believe I remembered that. Oh, and I'm growing the one that National Garden Bureau sent us. Is it Siam Gold? I think so. And I'm growing Keys Orange. Six. Six you're varieties. Just, you're out of control with your marigolds. I'm growing those. And I, the the orange jam, tangerine jam, lemon jam. I'm growing those. Those are good. And then I'll grow the one from National Garden Bureau. But I, I'm not growing more than that at the moment. Remember Gardener's think. World made me do it again. That's where yeah, the sun, you know, that's they where Sophia out. came from. Yeah. And that's where Court Jester came from. Those we, cool. We seem to be impressionable gardeners for old gals like us. I totally. <laughs> totally am. Okay. And so one thing I want to say about marigolds before we leave this topic, and you thought this was going to be short. Ha, huh, it's not been short. Marigolds get spider mites. So I know people they do. Send, I know you know this, but people send me their pictures of their spider mites all the time. And what do we do for spider mites? We, we give them a big them spray. Yes. With water, nothing else. You don't have to spray them with anything else. You just drench them because what do spider mites like? Hot, dry weather. So the minute you guys see that weird, if, you're, if your marigolds look slightly weird, I'm not talking about the flowers, but the leaves, just get water and drench those babies. Spider mites will be gone. And if the spider mites aren't gone and you can't get rid of them, get rid of the marigolds. Yeah, just let go of it. Go buy something at the garden center late in the season. They'll have they'll start to have the mums and the ornamental kales and things like that. Put those in. Get rid of those. That's there you my go. motto. Sweet peas. Love them sweet peas. I haven't sown mine yet. I'm thinking, oh gosh, what day is today? I should have sown you those. You better get two out weeks there. Ago. I know. Peas. I know. <laughs> Bad Carol. Bad gardener. My sweet peas are that tall. She's well, like, nobody can tell what, what am I saying, Carol? How six to eight inches. Six to eight yeah, inches. Yeah, they're doing did great. You, did you pinch them back? I need to right now. This is time. It's time to pinch them back. Yeah. So the branch, which is something I learned from Monty Don a long That's time right. ago. Okay. Morning glories. Okay. Morning glories are probably the easiest thing you ever grew in your life, but you I will cannot have them. recommend, I cannot recommend them because my sister, my youngest sister, she fights morning glories all through her garden because, you know, she let them grow one year, let them go to seed. And like you said, you now have them forever. So I'm just going to say this. Heavenly blue morning glory is definitely worth growing in your garden here. I won't suggest them for people in Indiana. That's up to them. But, you know, in my garden, it looks really great. And then I actually have a new one this year that I'm going to try. We'll see. Oh, and we should talk about that too. You scarify the seeds to get them to germinate faster. Or you can soak them, whichever way you want to do it. Or you can just let them go to seed in your garden like my sister did, and you will have them coming up everywhere. You Especially if it's Grandpa Otts, I'm just saying. Oh, I'm Grandpa sure. Grandpa Otts is the worst about that. The worst. I mean, at first she's like, oh, Marigold, I'll just let it grow over here and over there and no, everywhere. No. And then it, it's like, it. no, no, no. <laughs> Okay, so that's, I think we've gone through everything. So now, what are we going to, you're going to give them some information. I am. Seeds. I'm just going to say, we, we both kind of wrote the same thing different ways, mm -hmm. but the general rule of thumb is that you plant seeds twice as deep as their depth. And if you think about a marigold seed or a zinnia seed, zinnia. You, mm -hmm. you just barely cover them. But the main thing is you need a weed-free area. Work the soil up a little bit. You don't have to dig it down a foot or anything. Just scratch it really nice so that you've got some soil that's loose for them to germinate in. Water them in well. You don't have to water them like every single day. They'll come up uh -uh. and they then will. that's it. Water when you don't get rain in the summertime. And There's one more piece of that. And we both wrote it. So I said, I said the waiting is the hardest part. For them to germinate, and I go well. That and the thinning, thinning People really, really, really have trouble with thinning. And thinning, we don't mean you. Know, you got to get rid of excess seedlings so that those that are left can grow to mature size. 
And so I always say, well, I'm going to be very meticulous in sewing so that I don't have as many to thin, but that kind of always goes by the wayside. In fact, yeah, I, I always need to go out and thin them. my radishes at this moment. And I thin them more than once because some I've got so many birds out here that they eat some of my seedlings. So I first thin them just a little bit, and then I wait for the birds to get not interested in them, and then I thin them again. But that's just how I do it. Very good. So that was the throw and grow flowers. I bet our listeners can guess the next topic, which we're going to dive into after you do this quote. Gardening is the only unquestionably useful job. George Bernard Shaw. I didn't know George Bernard Shaw gardened. Well, I don't know if he did either. He may just have (laughs) had this quote. It might be from one of his plays or something. So guess what? What's what we're going to talk about in vegetables? Throw and grow veggies? Yeah. So we made this list and then I said, wait a minute, we got to separate out these because... (laughs) <laughs> because this list was just, what can you direct so outside? Do, 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 And we did it really fast, right? Right, right. Go ahead. Well, the, we separated. <laughs> there are the summer vegetables, which do not tolerate any frost on them. And then there are the spring and, and fall vegetables, which do tolerate some frost. And so that is confusing to people how this all works. But just trust us. Just trust us that it works. People, are It not, works. It works. So the frost tolerant ones that, and in your garden, people should have already sown these a while back. And in my garden, you know, you, if you haven't started them, you should go out right now. Lettuce, Mm -hmm. peas, spinach, most greens, turnips, beets. Those are your throw and grow frost Mm -hmm. tolerant. So frost won't hurt them. And this is also the part where you talk about beets and how they're actually seeds that are squished together. Yeah. Beets always look like that cereal. What is that cereal? Uh, Grape nuts. Grape nuts. I don't eat cereal anymore. So I don't even know if they're grape nuts anymore, but they do. They look like little pieces of grape nuts. Yeah. But it's actually, it's three or four seeds all glommed together. So when you plant Mm -hmm. beets, you got to, they have to be thin because you don't want three or four all growing together. But if you, if you look, there are some seed houses, and I think Johnny Selected Seeds is one of them, they will sell beet seeds that are singles that have been broken apart. And so those that sometimes makes gardening a little bit easier. So I was with someone the other day, a client, and it came up because she was telling me about how her beets had come up. And she said, and they look so great. And she showed me a picture of them. And I said, and that is three little baby plants right together. And you need to thin those. And she goes, oh, no. I said, yeah, oh, yes. that's how those, that's how they're set up. So right now, oh, and we ate lettuce out of my garden last night, which is really early, but I had sowed some lettuce for my husband. Remember when uh-huh. I sowed him that some inside and then I transplanted it outside. And then I also sowed some lettuce directly. And so we're already eating this tennis ball lettuce now, cool. which he was like, what? And I said, yeah, I put it in the cold frames. And then, of course, peas. I did sow some peas because you told me I should. So I did. And then I have a bunch of spinach this year because we've had this wonderful, nice, cool, long spring. And so I put spinach in like three places and it all came up, which that doesn't always happen for me in the spring. And then I didn't grow any beets. I grew turnips and I grew radishes. Yeah. One of the things not on our list is kale. I thought that fit under greens. Okay. But kale is true. Yeah. Yeah. But I, well, we didn't say radishes either, but you know, radishes are one of those too. I left some kale out in the garden last fall. And then I looked out there the other day and it's like, "Hmm, it's growing again. I probably could harvest some kale greens if I wanted them from that. I did that too. And actually it is now starting to flower. And so I'm going to pick the flowers off the top of it tonight and put them on top of our salad. Very nice. So the other type of throw and grow are the ones that do not tolerate frost at all. You got to wait until you are frost free. And that would be squashes of all kinds, cucumbers, okra, corn, and of course, green beans. Uh And beans that are dried because that's just a mature bean. Exactly. Green beans are just immature beans. Did we also say cucumbers? 
I might have said cucumbers. I don't know if you did or not, but we'll say it now. Cucumbers are another one. And so, no, those don't like frost. They are summer vegetables. And so one of the things when sowing seeds that people have to remember is it isn't always the air temperature, it's the soil temperature. And the sow and grow vegetables that don't tolerate frost also don't like cold soil. So people don't rush out there just because you think you're frost free. And by the way, I'd like to make a segue. Indiana's forecast for next week looks marvelous. 70s in the day, 40s, 50s at night. That does not mean Mm -hmm. we are frost free people. That does not mean we are frost free. And I'll just like to have to avoid social media where all these people are saying, can I go ahead and put my tomato plants out? No, you cannot. No, you Mm -hmm. cannot. Anyway, so soil temperature. And that's where like because of our mild winter, the soil warmed up faster this year. So I noticed my peas came up quicker than they normally do because the soil Uh was warmer. Right. That makes sense to me, too. So So while you were talking about soil temperatures and air temperatures, uh I think we can safely say that Oklahoma is probably frost free. We're at April 12th and next week, well, the rest of this week. Yeah. After today, well, this morning was 45, but after today, it's all in the 50s and 60s in the mornings and we go up into the 80s in the afternoon. So I will be eating that mature lettuce really fast. Yes, so it doesn't will. go bitter on me. And we'll see how my spinach does. Yeah, I, you know, finally, I would say at the end of this week, if you're just hot and bothered to get your tomatoes out, which we didn't say tomatoes, but that they don't sow and grow. But say you've you've started your transplants indoors and you've been taking them in and out and hardening them off, or you've bought them at your local nursery, which is another option, and that's fine too. You can probably plant them, but I won't be because I started mine late. And this is the part where we talk about how it's okay to put them in a little bit later. Exactly. Because they catch right up because tomatoes like it warm. And often, this is another tip from an old gardener like me, often planting later in the spring helps you avoid some insect problems. The one that comes to mind is eggplant gets flea beetles really bad. But if you'll wait and plant it out just a little bit later, even into the first week of June here, you'll have far fewer problems with flea beetles. Interesting. So I flea beetles hit me about mm, the end of May. So maybe this year I'll put it out first week of June if I decide to grow any. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. All right. So let's talk a little bit about days to maturity. We had a listener reach out to me on Instagram and we get asked this question a lot. What does days to maturity mean on a seed packet? And you know what? You would think that was easy, but not really. Not really. It's Depends. just a general guideline that tells you from, if it's a direct sown seed like green beans, it just gives you a general guideline that says 60 days, for example. I just pulled that out of the air. I think that's about right. That's how long it's going to take for that bean to germinate, grow, and produce another produce green beans. But it's just a guide. But, but if but, it's a plant, the the transplanty plants, which are like peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, another good example, those mean their maturity date is from the moment you transplant that plant to when you get your first fruit. So it's generally. not as simple as people think. Yeah. And that's a big range and It's a guideline. So rain, lack of rain, the amount of light your plants are getting, the temperature, the soil fertility, presence of absence or presence or absence of pollinators. So many factors go into how many days it takes to come to maturity. So it's a guideline and don't people should not overthink it or make it too complicated. The overriding factor when choosing a variety is, hey, do I like the taste of this variety? Buy that one. Mm -hmm. Or in my case, is it weird? Yeah. Is it weird? D will buy it. (laughs) Yeah. If it's from, you know, Seeds of Italy, D will buy it. The one, the (laughs) one place where I would count days to maturity and think, hmm, is this worth it? Is if you're going to grow succession plantings of like green beans and it says days to maturity is 60 
and you're sitting like, say, it's September 1st for Carol, likely you're not going to get a bean green harvest out of that because by November 1st, 60 days later, we would have had frost. So that's where in the fall, you kind of pay attention a little bit more to say, is this worth planting now? Yeah, even in Oklahoma, if it's late September, well, it's the same problem. We're not going to, we're probably not going to get, because here's the thing, it we are also, it has to do with daylight. And as your daylight goes down, the chances of you getting a crop are also smaller. So true that. So that covers the throw and grow vegetable topic and a little bit about soil temperature and days to maturity. Days to maturity. I'm going to do a quote so we can talk about the book. We read in bed because reading is halfway between life and dreaming, our own consciousness in someone else's mind. Anna Quinlan, How Reading Changed My Life. You know, I've read almost everything by Anna Quinlan, and I have never read that book. I might I have, have to read, read that it. book. I think did I you enjoy it? Yes, I think I did. I think I'm, she's such a good writer. She really is. She's one of those that just, she's really good at the essay, which not everybody is. Okay, on our bookshelf this week is a book that was sent to me, and it's called Outside In, Interiors Born from Nature by Brian Paquette, and it was published by Gibbs Smith, and it just showed up. I didn't ask for it, but it, I'm glad I got it. So it's a, he is a famous interior design person, and he has got a firm that is based in Seattle, Brian does, and he showcases several of his recent designs in this coffee table-sized book. And if you like mid-century modern minimalist interiors, this book is definitely for you. And what I enjoyed about it is that every design incorporates natural colors, from the surrounding landscape. So lots of neutral shades with touches of warm browns, blues, grays, and greens, which makes perfect sense because he lives in Seattle, which to me, Seattle is those colors. Then the furniture shapes are very simple, extremely well-made, and the fabrics are from really quality materials. No, I am not reading this from the materials that they sent with the book. This is actually what I wrote after looking at it. It just sounds like that. He has a lot of beautiful polished wood and lovely rugs. And it was very, very enjoyable to look at. And actually, I'm going to give it to my friend, Father Novak. And I shot a picture of it this morning and texted it to him and said, I'm giving you this book because he has a condominium where he is his own space. And it is designed as though Brian, I think it's pronounced Paquette. It could be Paquette but I'm going to say Paquette. It just reminds me of his style. And so he was like, thanks. And I said, you're welcome. So I think all of these components would also work at my log cabin because I use a lot of these colors in my design, but right. I am not a minimalist. I know you are surprised by this, Carol. I am not. <laughs> I am not a minimalist. I like stuff. And the thing is, is I've noticed though, as I'm aging, I have started giving away stuff. So like, I mean, I've never been super attached to my stuff. I I like it for a time and then I say bye-bye to it and send it on its way, but I've gotten more that way. So are you a minimalist? I'm looking at your bookshelf behind you. Yeah, you look at the bookshelf <laughs> behind me and stuff and these plants over here. This is not a minimalist. I would tend towards maximalist, but, you know, it's kind of interesting, but I, I group things together so that they stand out a bit more. It's like at Easter, mm -hmm. my youngest sister, it's like, you have been here. She looks up and, you know, she sees the antique lawn sprinklers on top of the china cabinet in the breakfast nook. And she's like, where'd you get those? I'm like, from the antique sprinkler store. Where do you think? <laughs> and anyway, my other sister said that her six-year-old daughter they really just come here once a year for the Easter egg hunt. She said she was excited to see my coffee table. It's one of those with the glass top and then it's got the big drawer underneath so you can put all kinds of displays. I have all kinds of trinkets and old seed packets and just little rocks and nature things uh -huh. under there. And they just love to look at that. Like, you know, look at all this stuff under here. But if I didn't have that, I mean, I wouldn't put that all out for display. It would make it too hard to clean and so I, I like things to be sort of orderly, yeah. but there's a lot of stuff. Well, I'm going to show you a picture out of this book. And this is a kitchen and it's beautiful, right? It is beautiful. 
but it looks like no one lives here. It, yeah, and it so, looks like an Airbnb that's being cleaned up and is ready for the next person. Yeah, and of course, you know, these are his designs, and so he wants them to look exactly like he finished them. But I like, like, I'm looking at, I'm sitting at my desk in my kitchen, and I'm looking around, and I love my pictures of things, and I, I think I would really miss those if I didn't have my personal touches. Yeah, and, and another example, you know, it's like, you need to enjoy the things you have. And so I've talked about my mom did these acrylic paintings back in the yes. 60s and 70s. And I had a bunch of them in the closet that does nobody any good. And so my wall space in my hallways was bare. So I just hung up all her artwork and, you know, these two art galleries in two hallways for my mom. And it's nice to go down the hallway and see mom's paintings. And I offered them to my nieces and nephews as like, if you'd like to display one in your home, you are more than... T- willing to borrow one from the collection. And they so. said, no, thank you, because they're all minimalists, because they just seem to be, right? No, not my, my one niece has one of mom's paintings. And I wouldn't say, I'd say I have one niece that my sister says she's a minimalist. But I, I'd say most of them enjoy stuff. They grew up with, they didn't grow up in a very clean swept environment. There's always stuff yeah. around and Anyway, so almost all of my kids are minimalists, except my son. He's not really. He likes to display. He has beautiful cookware that I bought him for his Christmas and birthday presents, and he displays it. And something you said reminded me of a reel I did on Instagram about how I use my blue and white spode. Right. That reel was, I didn't expect that reel to be popular. I was just talking. And so people were like, yeah, I'm going to get my china out too. And so a lot of people, have got an attitude like mine now, which is you better use it because what are we saving it for? Exactly. So that's how I'm going to end that. I suspect his clients put their personal touches af- onto his beautiful landscape, interior landscape. Right. And it's a beautiful book. And so I'm glad I got it because it's something different. Yeah. Very good. We'll do that next quote. And let's talk about our dirt. April is the sweetest month of the year, the mellow season of rebirth and renewal. And that's by Mary Sojourner. And here's our dirt, which I found, but you can talk about because I'm tired. (laughs) So you found this article, Atlas Obscura, about spotted lanternfly honey, which sounds disgusting. (laughs) But I read through the whole article this morning, and it is really quite interesting how the spotted lanternfly and the honeydew that it secretes, and it has to do with the tree of heaven, and then the honeybees get on that, and they carry some of that stuff back to their hives. And so they've ended up in 2010, 2012 timeframe. No, later than that, 2019, 2020. Mm -hmm. They had this honey that had sort of a smoky flavor to it. And so they've done a ton of investigation. Because when your honey doesn't taste right, they have to figure mm-hmm. out where's where's the taste coming from because they don't want to sell honey that's got maybe pesticides in it by, you know, or mold. Accident There's or lots of mold. things that can happen. Yeah. And they, I'll read this. So from the article, they said variations from season to season and year to year aren't uncommon. Honey will naturally shift in character as temperature and weather influence which plants contribute to spring and fall nectar flows. Humans can affect it too. A Brooklyn beekeeper's honey was tainted with red 40 food dye when her bees got into the syrup at a nearby maraschino cherry factory in 2010. And in 2012, bees feeding on discarded M&M candy shells in France produced blue and green honey. Yeah, which they had to discard both of those. I I read the one about the French because all of a sudden their honey was this weird color and they had to they had to go follow the bees to figure out where they were getting into this. So they call this new honey. And so they did all this testing on it. They determined that it is safe for consumption, has Mm -hmm. an interesting flavor. They call it doom bloom. And so you, you can buy this. But anyway, I did learn that there's something called a a honey sommelier. Did yep. I say that right? You did. Who basically tastes honey. That, that's yeah. What they're t- anyway. They're like wine, but it's honey because honey has terroir the same way that 
other stuff does. And so, I mean, they probably technically don't call it terroir, but it doesn't matter. Like my honey is the most floral honey I've ever had in my life. And we still have several jars of it and everybody just sort of, you know, holds on to it as hard as they can because I don't have bees here anymore. I do have a neighbor within three miles who has bees because his bees, his or her bees visit my house. But I don't know if I'll be drinking. I, I will not eat. I can just say it up front. I will not eat doom bloom honey. I'm not interested. But several people where I first saw this article commented and they went and bought some because they're fascinated yeah. by it. Yeah, I'm not buying it. I'm not getting no, thanks. it. thanks. No, thanks. All right. So I feel like I'm doing all the quotes, but I guess I'm not. Here's a quote for the rabbit holes, which note on your notes that you don't have the right information on your rabbit hole. Oh, okay. Spring will come and so will happiness. Hold on. Life will get warmer. And that is Anita Krizan. That's because I put my rabbit hole where it was supposed to be my thing for next week. I really don't have a rabbit hole this week. I was too busy gardening. I I know the feeling, but it was rainy here. So, and I I discovered a new herb that I did not know about, Dee. I didn't know about this either when I so saw it this morning. I was at the library and I always check out the seed library and it's in an old card catalog. And on one of the drawers, it said, and a C-U-L-A-N-T-R-O, not cilantro. And I'm going to, I want to pronounce that cilantro. Yeah, I don't know. Or is it cilantro? I don't know. But it's. I don't know. <laughs> it's in the carrot family, same as cilantro, but it's it's basically a biennial herb that's grown throughout this, the Caribbean and Central America, key ingredient in Puerto Rican cooking, relatively unknown in the United States, often mistaken for cilantro, although when you look at the two plants, they look completely different. So this looks like a narrow-leafed lettuce. And interesting. So it, it is very interesting, but it's often used in place of cilantro. And I'm I'm gonna say I'm I still want to make that cilantro, but it might be cilantro. We could ask our friend Perla over there and yeah, we should ask Perla. But it's huh. you can grow it in pots or in the ground, and they said in the ground this herb would continue to reproduce for an almost endless supply. Now I don't think in our environment it would overwinter at all, but. It it looks like, it looks like, like I said, like a narrow lettuce. So here's my question. Does it not bolt the way cilantro does? It's a biennial. So I don't know if it would bolt in. Until the, the second year. Yeah. Yeah. Like if parsley. it overwintered. If it overwintered. But it well, sounds. That would be better for here, at least in Oklahoma, yes. because we have that issue with cilantro bolting at the first warm day. Yes. And I'd love to tell you that, oh, I picked up a packet of seeds at the library, but they are out of that seed. And I don't know if they're going to get any more. I just keep checking back. But so they also said it might be attractive to beneficial insects such as ladybugs, green lacewigs, provides an excellent defense in the garden against aphids. And all this is from the University of Florida Cooperative Extension. Anyway, it just sounds huh. really good. And so that was rabbit hole number one. Rabbit That's hole a great number rabbit hole. It is. Good thing and you have two since I have a zero. So I did get a copy of the book, Pioneer American Gardens. And I think I described last week how I was looking for some other garden writer information. Saw this book listed on a newspaper page from the 1950s. Uh -huh. Books for sale. And it's called Pioneer American Gardens, compiled by Elvinia Slauson. I'm going to hold it up for you. Look at that. Oh, that's cool. I had to look at this. I don't know why I did that, but I was trying so, to see it without the. There are chapters cover. for every area, multiple chapters for, and it's divided by areas of the country. So I uh -huh. thought, wonder what's written by for Indiana. And guess what? What? I found Helen Link. For Indiana listeners, Helen Link was a famous growing daffodils and actually hybridized some. Yeah. And she, the property that she and her husband had. It's just outside of Mooresville somewhere, and there's actually a planetarium there. And anyway, people go there in the spring to see the daffodils that Helen Link left as sort of her legacy. Mm -hmm. They naturalized. She was one of the members of my garden club back in the 50s. So look up Oklahoma. I'm excited about your Indiana member. 
anyway, so that was kind of interesting because I always thought if I've never found a garden writer, a lost lady of garden writing from Indiana. And I always right. thought if there was one, it might be somebody like Helen Link. And now I found at least a chapter that she wrote. So let me And go. by golly, it was. Yeah. So I was pretty excited about that. So you are in the central region. And it's hard to say because that one stood out because she wrote a chapter called Early Indiana Horticulture. Huh. Um, oh, Early Settlers in Early Settlers of Oklahoma by Lilia Oglesby. Page 211. Lilia oh, Oglesby. A, I'm going to go look her up. Lilia Ogles. L-E. Okay. I'll have to spell that for you. L-E-L-I-A and then Oglesby. Uh-huh. Got it. Page 211. Interesting. I want to read yeah. that section because the pioneers of Oklahoma. Yeah. it's it. None of these are very long. I will. I'll take a picture of those pages and I will send it to you. Thank you. So that you can see cool. that. But then I thought, wow. And I just opened up this rabbit hole this morning. So I'm like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> anyway, well, I talked too much. Okay, it's, no, it's time for your last eclipse update. So the good news is in Indiana, skies were fairly clear. There was a few little wispy clouds. We had a uh-huh. great view of the eclipse straight from our, in my neighborhood. You can just sit out on your driveway or some people in their backyards and it was just as clear as you would want it to be 76 Uh degrees and you know start i used that app and started out an hour before and watched that moon move in front of that sun slowly 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 and then it's just like bam it happens and you've got your three minutes or so of total eclipse Uh and you know the lights go on outside it got really quiet yeah. Felt like the wind was very still and stuff. And so that, and then three minutes and 50 seconds later, glasses go back on because it's starting to shift. So, the do you other want to way. hear my eclipse experience? I do. I had one. You didn't know that, did you? I didn't tell yeah. you. Okay. So, I, well, I, let me first say down in southeastern Oklahoma, it was hazy and cloudy and it cleared off right before the eclipse. So, everybody who went to Hocha Town and all those other places, they got to see it. So good for them because that's a hard trip to not get to see anything. My experience was I was out shopping for plants because I was finishing up my pots and it had been hazy all morning long and just weird haziness. And so I was in the parking lot at Ace Hardware on 15th and Broadway in Edmond. And this lady walked up next to me and she goes, isn't it time for the eclipse? And I said, yeah, it's pretty close to time. And I said, it's supposed to happen at 1.30-ish here. And she goes, I forgot my glasses. And I said, well, run home and watch it from your house. I mean, if you're worried about it. And she goes, nah, I don't care. I've seen it before. I said, well, so have I. So we're shopping. All of a sudden, it got cold. It got really, yes. really cold. And I thought, oh, the eclipse is happening. Because you couldn't really tell because we weren't totality. So I went inside, paid for my stuff, came back outside. Two girls had glasses in the parking lot who were employees because a lady gave them some. And I said, do you guys have eclipse glasses? Is it, I says, is it at its moment? You know? And she goes, it is at its moment. Do you want to see? I said, sure. Why not? So I put on the glasses. I looked up and it was all completely covered except for a tiny little sliver. So I had an eclipse moment. There you go. Very good. Very good. Are you happy? Are you I'm happy that I happy. participated? I am very happy that you participated. <laughs> and my understanding is there was not huge traffic snarls in Indiana. People moved around, got there to where was they needed to go. Trying to get to southeast Oklahoma, there was a little bit, but they worked it out. Yeah. I I mean, I I wasn't paying attention because I wasn't gonna go anywhere, but I did see on Facebook that one of my cousins who lives in southern Indiana had gone to visit a friend in California. And by happenstance, she was on a flight that left Dallas, like at one Dallas time. So she Mm -hmm. flew kind of with the eclipse into Southern Indiana, which she had some interesting pictures because the, the horizon is what people said was pretty amazing to see the horizon because it looked like a sunset anyway. Yeah, it was really cool. You sent me that picture. That is it. That is it. For the eclipse. There's not another That's one it. for um, 20 years. Yeah. In 2045 and I'll be an old lady and I will not be doing a podcast. And so if I am still doing a podcast, it won't be like this probably. 
Garden commissions. I'm going to weed. I've started and I've been pulling out a lot of my aster that's a problem. And there's just so much more to do. I'm at that stage where there are just so many weeds. We've had enough rain, had great temperatures. I'm also going to cut the crepe myrtles back now because they've come out of dormancy. And so I can see where their dead are, where the dead is and where the live is. And then I'm going to try to get control of Asian honeysuckle, which I want to point out to people, I did not plant that Asian honeysuckle. It showed up here because my husband's grandmother and I, it has run amok this year. So it's time I will be, I'm not going to lie to people. I will be using some weed killer on it because I chop it way, way back. I put a little bit of weed killer on it. That's already mixed. Wear long sleeves to use it. And then I come in with gloves later and I dig it out and that's, and it still won't be gone. There's no way to get rid of it. So I wrote ha ha next to that, the getting control of, so because right. it's not going to happen. So there you go. Well, and I dug out a honeysuckle. They they just show up and they're so easy to spot right now, but I pulled it up by its roots, threw it on the sidewalk, stomped on it, and then put it in the trash. I put that on my blog last week, I think. Anyway, as soon as the rain stops, I got to weed and mow and weed and weed. And I seriously need to do something about the winter sown containers. Everything came up. I have... Big purple broccoli, the National Garden Bureau sent us I'm the so AAS excited. winter. I mean, these things are like six inches tall saying, get us out, get us out. Yeah, you Clary Sage, though. Clary Sage came up, poppies came up, lots of violas, Verbena Bampton, Baby's Breath came up, Alaska Daisies came up. So I've got a lot of stuff to sort of figure out what's their next step in life. The only seeds that didn't germinate were the stocks, which I thought was what? That's bizarre. Who knows? That is bizarre. Who who knows? Uh, who that knows? reminds me, I I got a plant deal from Doom and Orange, a whole bunch of those. Uh-huh. I got a plant out. I don't know where I'm going to put them, but I'll find places. And then thank you, Doom and Orange, for the plants. They always send me plants and God bless them. They're always really good. And actually, you know where they're grown at? But I just know this because they sent me an email. Peace Valley Farm. You know who that is? I'll just Shouldn't tell you. Have. It's Lloyd Traven. Yeah. Who is famous say. for phenomenal lavender and a bunch of other stuff. But he actually gave up my name because I think they have a new publicity guy. And anyway, or actually it's a woman. I had another guy write me from another company. Anyway, they're coming. And then my hilarious select seeds order, which I sent to you a picture because that was the middle of winter when I ordered that stuff. It makes absolutely no sense. It's <laughs> like, like I was drunk, but I don't drink. So I don't really understand. I don't understand it either. But I thought, man, those people must have thought this lady. Anyway, I think <laughs> that's enough a- for this week. Let's <laughs> wrap this thing up. Thank you for listening to The Garden Angelus. I hope you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. We publish every week on Wednesdays at 12 a.m. Eastern Time. And if you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love another one of those five-star reviews. That helps us get noticed by the stupid algorithm. Could you also share our podcast with your friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. And be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And if you're smart, subscribe to our Substack newsletter, The Garden Angelus at Substack.com, which is linked to in our show notes and gives you much more information about the podcast. If you do subscribe, you'll get a link to listen to the podcast a whole day early. And if you want to help support us, use those affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we're in a small commission and it costs you nothing. Or if you want, you can set up a monthly subscription through Buzzsprout, or you can make a one-time donation through PayPal. And thank you to those who have done so. It helps us pay for podcast hosting. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the Garden Gate this week. Bye until next week. Bye, everybody.